So good evening and uh, welcome back to our study entitled, I Am a Lutheran. And tonight we're going to go through lesson five entitled, I Am a Lutheran and here am I, send me. Um, perhaps that you, that you read that title or you hear that title and uh, that, that uh, uh, evangelism hymn, Hark the Voice of Jesus Crying comes to mind. Um, especially that last line of the first stanza, who will answer gladly saying, here am I, send me, send me, right? Um, so we're going to talk about uh, mission work in the Lutheran Church and why this is something that is very important, uh, not only um, as part of our heritage, but also um, as we carry out the work that Christ has given us to do. So, before we do that, why don't we open up with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for uh, bringing us into the Christian faith. Um, and you made that happen through the means of grace. And the means of grace was given to us through your servants, pastors and teachers, parents and grandparents, and they were doing what you have called them and us to do, mission work. Um, you want us to share your word with as many people as possible, um, not just strangers, but also our very own family and friends. Um, you have given us the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. And so we ask that you would embolden us to continue carrying out that great commission, uh, both with the people in our lives and those we have not met. Um, bless our study tonight, O oh Lord, as we talk about uh, being a part of mission work and why it's something that we should prioritize in your church. Bless us tonight, and we pray all of this. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay, so I have uh, four statements that I would like to dissect. Um, are these statements, are there good things um, it, within the statements? Are there bad things or are you indifferent to the statements? And let me know why. So, are these statements good, bad, or somewhere in between? Here's the first statement. Mission work is the most important thing we do as Christians. If we are not sharing God's word with those who do not know it, we are hardly acting like Christians. Is that a good statement, a bad statement, or just kind of, you know, it's good, but maybe could be better, you know, kind of that middle ground. What do you think, Carolyn? Uh, I think it's important because um, uh, as I've been reading the Bible and studying it, you need to keep your faith and you need to go to the Lord's word and you also need the sacraments. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to be an example of that to tell somebody else. And sure. if you aren't doing what you're saying, you're <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. not, not doing things right. Okay. So yeah, you 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 stress the importance of, you know, actually walking the walk as well as talking the, the talk. talk. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. It, it is so important that we, um, that we ourselves are being strengthened by God's means of grace and that we study God's word and know what the word says so that we are properly equipped to share our faith with others. Um, yeah, the, the first part of this statement says mission work is the most important thing that we do as Christians. Um, that That's a pretty strong statement there to say that it is the most important thing that we do. Um, I mean, I, it's, could we do, can we absolutely definitely say that it is the most important thing? Um, one could make that argument. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, taking care of those who are in God's flock 
um, certainly ranks up there as well. So, you know, not only taking care uh, and bringing in those who are lost, but also taking care of those who are already in Christ's flock. So maybe you could say, you know, it's 1A and 1B, taking care of those who are in Christ's flock and going out and doing mission work, seeking those who are lost. Um, I mean, that's what the church is all about. Uh, the, the church is already, or the church is all about equipping the saints and uh, seeking the lost, right? So, you know, you could say that it is the most important thing, um, or you could say that it is equally important as equipping the saints that already are. Uh, the second statement, we don't need to invite the unchurched or the de-churched to worship. They know where we are and what time our services begin. Good, bad, or indifferent? I think it's uh, bad because if you want to get a new person to come to church you, and you talk to them about it, how the service is set up and that, and they don't want to walk into a place unknown, totally strange to them, they want somebody that they can quote, cleave to. They know they have a friend there who's going to be there for them. Sure. And if they see you doing what you said mm -hmm. in your conversations, they'll respect you for that. Sure. Right. Okay. Um, in other words, yeah. we're we're we are doing the walk and doing the talk at the same right. time. Right. Walking the walk and talking the talk. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's that's a dangerous assumption that this second statement makes. Mm -hmm. um, they know where we are and what time our services begin. Um, I've had conversations with people um, both here in East Troy and as I think about my previous congregation out in Washington, um, where I, you know, they ask me, well, where's your church at? And I say, well, it, it's on Highway 20, you know, or, you know, out in Washington, I would say that we are on the corner of 27th Street and Tacoma Avenue. And they said, really? I never noticed. I drive past that. I drive down that street all the time and I've never noticed your church before. So um, you never want to assume that people just no. know that, hey, we're here and we're worshiping on Sunday mornings at nine o'clock. Yeah. I mean, our building has been here for decades and the sign out there all, you know, says, you know, when we worship, but just because people, you know, go past our building doesn't mean that they know that we're here or why we're here. So um and, and not to mention, you know, uh, Scripture talks about, you know, how can they call on the one that they haven't heard, right? So there has to be someone who goes to them, right? And so um, I would definitely say that that second statement is not a good statement to make. And yet, I've heard people make those comments before. So um, it's not like it's uh, a totally foreign uh mindset to have statement number three the work of spreading the gospel to the four corners of this world is something best done by others who have trained for it there is little i can do there's a lot a person a lay person can do okay as long as they're you know they're making friends out in the real world and then if you get on the subject of religion, you can open up as to why you believe this and this and where you go to church and how it, how the sermon, how the service is, uh, order of service and reading the gospel and the lessons. And so you're learning God's word. And then the best part of yet, if you're a member of the congregation, you can have your sins washed away. By going to the Lord's Supper. Yeah, that's and true. You are in a, if you're in a in a church in a congregation, and it's like you're in a flock. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And uh, uh, you may meet them out shopping, and you'll stand and chit chat for a while while your husband stands up. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> are you speaking from experience? Yes, here, I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> You talking to people? What? That's that's not what you do, Carolyn. You're you're not much of a talker, are you? 
if the opportunity presents <laughs> itself, yes. No, I, I know you are. And, and I love that about you. So as I think about, you know, what this third statement says, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, you know, spreading the gospel to the four corners of the world, right? So I think the, the implication there is, you know, world missions, right? It's something best done by others who have been trained for it. To, to, a, to a certain extent, we could say, yeah, there's some truth to that. Um, you but know, we don't, you? we don't just, yeah. we don't just send, you know, who, you know, anybody to do world mission work. You know, there there definitely is some training. You know, you definitely want a, a pastor to go there. Um, but of course, you also have to learn about the culture, um, because if you want to uh, have a greater audience for the gospel, you have to know how to communicate to them in their language using their culture. So that's very important. And so, yeah. World mission work, to a certain extent, is best done by those who are trained to do it and have a desire to do it. But that last part there, there is little I can do. Oh, that's that's far from the truth, right? That is very, very far from the truth because there is a lot that we can do. Um, you know, we have our own mission field, like you said, Carolyn, in our own backyard, right? Um, the 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 our neighbors, our family members, our friends, acquaintances, whoever, right? We have our own mission field right where we live. But even in world missions, you know, we can still help. Um, you know, we can give offerings to support the continued uh, gospel ministry of world missions, you know, we can write a letter to a missionary encouraging them to continue doing their work for the Lord. Um, we can definitely pray that God would bless the work of world missions. So there's plenty of things that we can do, even if we're not going to all four corners of the mm -hmm. earth, but we can still do a lot for world mission work where we are right now. Statement number four. Mission work was important back in the day, but now in our modern age, everyone has access to the information they need. Mission work isn't really necessary anymore. Good, bad, or somewhere in between? I would say it's bad. Okay, why? There are still many people, even in their own country, mm -hmm. that don't know the first thing about any religion about the Bible yeah. and what it all means, much less all the other people in the world, like that are in Africa or Asia or wherever. And once, and and I know we have missionaries in Africa, medical missionaries. Mm -hmm. Those people are eager to hear. And once they understand it, some of their own people will go to school to be pastors. Sure. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. So it's still a very important part. It is, right. Um, when you're proclaiming the gospel, uh, there, there, it, it, there's very much a, a personal aspect to that work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, regardless of how blessed you are with technology, um, Christ wants us to do the work personally. Um, technology doesn't replace mission work. And besides that, um, a statement like this, you know, that everyone has access to the information they need, you know, kind of assumes that people are going to go searching for the truth. Mm -hmm. And that just is not the case. It's um, people, if, if people are lost, oftentimes they don't know that they're lost. You know, it's not like they're just going to wake up one day and say, you know what, I need to learn more about Christianity. You know, like that, ju that just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. It happens because of a personal relationship. Like I said, technology does not replace mission work. Um, and, and to assume that people are just going to stumble upon the, the gospel truth, uh, that, that just doesn't happen. Um, people aren't going to search for what they need if they don't know that they need it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I and I mean, while it's true that, you know, everyone does have access to, you know, good, solid, um, you know, uh, biblical teaching out there, there's plenty of it on the internet for sure. 
but um, they may have they, questions. They, they, right, they, they might have questions. But again, um, you're assuming that someone is just going to want to search for that. And that, that isn't the case. So, I was going to say, I belong to the Veterans of Foreign Wars Auxiliary. The people we have now in the higher echelon think that everybody has a computer. Mm hmm well, some people who are uh, in our my, our my organization are up in years. They are not going to invest in a computer. Oh, right. Yeah. And to much less learn how to use it. I learned how to use it from work. Mm -hmm. And then with my daughter, what she taught me. And uh, it still does not place one-on-one. -on -one. Right. It doesn't. You're, you're absolutely right. And I, I appreciate you bringing up that, that first point that you made that it also assumes that everyone has the means to access that information. Um, and even that is not entirely true. So this last statement makes a lot of assumptions that uh, aren't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. So I think we can see here um, from these four statements, you know, as we look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of those four statements, um, that there is a big need for mission work, um, especially as you see uh, the growing illiteracy rate of basic biblical knowledge. You know, um, it used to be back in the day that you could make mention of, you know, a very well-known Bible story like Noah and the Ark or, you know, Adam and Eve or, um, you know, David and Goliath, right? You know, th those very well-known Bible history lessons were well-known to the general public, um, but biblical illiteracy is on the rise, if I were to mention, you know, David and Goliath to, you know, some Joe Schmo on the street, they were like, what are you talking about? What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, back in the day, you know, people would at least kind of have an idea what it means. It means, oh, yeah, there's there's a, a, a big guy, um, you know, and he's fighting, you know, the little guy, right? The underdog fighting, you know, the favored, you know, mm -hmm. giants, you know, and, and uh, of course, there's more to the David and Goliath story than that, um, but at least they kind of have a sense of what that's all about. Y you can't make that assumption today. Uh, biblical illiteracy is on the rise, um, and, and so there is a growing need now more than ever to do mission work. So let's talk about what God's Word says in regard to doing mission work. Um, so we're going to read a few sections of scripture and uh, see what God says. Uh, first, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Um, and uh, Carolyn, I'm going to let you do the reading. So okay. would you mind reading Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8? Okay. Uh, Isaiah's commission. In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled with filled the temple. Above him were seraph, seraphats, each with six wings, with two wings covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. <clears throat> At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin stone, stoned for. Uh, atoned, uh, for. atoned for, yeah, there you go. When I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, 
here I am, send me. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, quite a vision that Isaiah sees. Uh, at first, what is Isaiah aware of here? Um, and, and what is it that frightens him? He sees a king sitting you know, at, at, on a throne, ex high and exalted, yeah, and it, his robe fills the temple. And yeah. then above him were the, they were actually, would they be angels? Yeah, the seraphs, yep. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, he describes the, the wings and how many wings he had and what they did, and how they were calling to each other, you know, keeping in contact. Right. Singing that. And yeah. then he describes how the, the doorpost and threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke, which could think, well, gee, it's going to be, it's burning. And he mm -hmm. was going to be ruined. And like he said, he was a man of unclean lips. And the seraphs no noted that. And one of them took the coal and burned his lips and said that he was clean. And he, he said, and he said, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he was so moved that he said, here I am, send me. Yeah. This relates as to how, in my interpretation, how a person who is studying the Bible and they feel they need to do this work. Sure. Yeah. Right. And uh, that just like, uh, even though my daughter went to Eau Claire to uh, college, so did her husband. They both are now Synod certified teachers. And uh, Josh went to MLC, and he's teaching at uh, Fox Valley. Yeah. Right now, he's the wide receivers football coach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 you know you, you, know, you bring up a good point though in that uh, the reason people you know pastors teachers and even lay Christians are moved to say here am I send me is because they are recipients and or they understand that they are recipients of God's love and his grace and they are so moved by that that they say here am I send me but going back to the first question what was it I, that Isaiah was aware of and what frightened him he he was he saw the lord mm -hmm. right he was a, a man who was unholy in the presence of a holy god and that frightened him um you think about the other instances where God makes his presence known among people on earth, and it always frightens them. Uh, when um, when Moses uh, came to the Lord in the burning bush, right? God said, take off your sandals because the land you are standing on is holy. Moses was afraid because he figured out he was talking with the Lord. Uh, on Mount Sinai, uh, when the Lord came in the thunder, the lightning, the fire, the earthquake, the thick cloud of smoke uh, on Mount Sinai, and then God spoke from the mountain, uh, the people were scared because they, they, as unholy people, were in the presence of a holy God. And we see the, the same sort of reaction where Isaiah, who is an unholy man, just as everyone else is, uh, is in the presence of a holy God, and it frightens him. But... How does the Lord take away his fear? He sent angels, actually. They were the angels. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the one of them, <clears throat> uh, since he said he had unclean lips, and one who took the coal from the fire and put it on his lips and said that uh, his sin, uh, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atone for okay so yeah so it, he, it's he was forgiven right exactly so um you know god taking away his sin um that was what took away his fear and so it's kind of interesting also um if you read in the book of jeremiah when when god commissioned the prophet jeremiah he also touched the prophet's mouth just like these coals touched isaiah's lips Right. So here uh, you have Isaiah who, had, you know, he's been told that his sin is taken away, his guilt atoned for. Um, that gives him the confidence that he needs to, to go and say, um, you know, 
I'm not afraid anymore. And then how does Isaiah respond to this call? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? He says, here am I, send me. And as we talked about earlier, Carolyn, and, and I'm glad you brought that up and you used your, your grandchildren as an example, it's, it's, what, it's the gospel, the good news of what Christ has done for us, the good news of our sins being removed. That's what compels people to want to share that good news. Uh, there's always going to be a reaction when people hear the gospel. Either they are going to love it and they are overwhelmed and moved by God's love, or they are going to hate it and reject it. Um, so uh, here we see Isaiah being moved by God's love and goodness. And so when God says, who am I going to send? Isaiah says, I'm right here. Send me. I, I want to go because you have taken away my sin. You've been so good to me, um, even though I don't deserve it. All right, let's go ahead to John chapter 1, then, as our next section of Scripture. John chapter 1, and we'll read uh, verses 35 through 42. Um, this is a section of scripture where Jesus calls his first disciples. John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42. Would you like to read this, Carolyn? Sure, let's see, get it. Let's see. John chapter 1. Jesus' first 35. disciples. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent the day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Let's see how far to go for you. Andrew, Simon Peter, a brother who was of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Caiaphas? Cephas. Cephas, which when translated is Peter. All right. Thank you. Um, two different people point out Christ to others in this account. Who are they? Who are the two people in this section of scripture that that draw attention to Jesus? John was one of them. Which John? Uh, that's right. Who's the one who said, Behold, the Lamb of God? That's John. I don't know who it is. Jo it was this Jesus' cousin. Uh, John the, the, Baptist? the Baptist. Right, very good. So uh, the next day, John uh, saw Jesus and said, Look, the Lamb of God. So John the Baptist uh, pointed people to Jesus. Um, and, uh, you know, as, so, as soon as John said that, you know, his two disciples left him and went and followed Jesus. Um, and, and that's exactly what John wanted. Mm -hmm. He wanted his disciples to go. Uh, Christ is here. Go follow him. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, John's work, uh, was basically to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Now he's here. So John's like, Hey, look, there he is. Go follow him. Um, my one. job is my job is is winding down here. And then, well, who was the other person? Andrew. That, right, Andrew, uh, one of Jesus' uh, the apostles. He went and told his brother Simon Peter, "We have seen the Lord. We 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 have found the Messiah." So you have John the Baptist first, followed by Andrew, who went and told his brother Peter. Uh, what is different about the way in which they point others to Christ? So uh, they, what's they different for, for other people that they knew and maybe had heard, but they wanted to make sure they met him in person so they would understand. Okay. 
Okay, sure. It's just like when you get a new pastor in a in a church, you have to get uh, familiar the way he gives a sermon, how he talks and carries himself and speaks with other people. Mm -hmm. So they had to learn from the ground up, just like the a congregation who gets a new pastor. Okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think as you look at, you know, the way John points out Jesus and the way that Andrew points out Jesus, um, you know, there, there are some, there are some similarities, but there are also some differences. Um, you know, John, uh, you know, had baptized Jesus by this point and, uh, you know, Jesus comes on by again and John says, look, the Lamb of God. And then they just went, you know, um, and then as far as Andrew, you know, he went to his family member, someone that he knew and, and was very close with his, his fisherman brother and said, hey, we have found the Messiah um, and, and actually physically brought him to Jesus. So here, so you have John the Baptist who simply proclaims it. And then you have Andrew who actually is like, come, let me show you, you know, let, let me bring you to Jesus himself. So Andrew makes it a little more personal. Whereas John's proclamation is just a general statement of fact. Look, the Lamb of God, there he is. Go follow him. Whereas Andrew says, let me bring you to him personally, okay? Uh, what is the reason for both of them to bring others to Christ? What, what's the main reason behind why they did that? They, want, they were proclaiming that the Messiah was there, and they wanted to make sure that they saw him. And, uh, and I think Jesus knew that they would follow him. Sure. Okay. You know, yeah. the Lord can read our hearts. He can, certainly. And that is what I think the Lord did, unbeknown to them, you know, which is very possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when he uh, changed uh, Simon's, you are Simon, son of John, and they ca called him Peter, translated his name to Peter. So uh, they all had a very good understanding from the ground up. Yeah. You have to start with the basics. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just like you have to do in any job that you take in the real world. Okay. All right. Um, I think the main reason for why they pointed others to Christ is because, um, well, John certainly knew what the Christ was all about, right? Um, in his proclamation, uh, he said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, John the Baptist knew that Jesus had come to save people from their sins, to rescue them from hell. Um, and he knew that, uh, you know, that salvation comes through Christ alone and that uh, it comes through faith in him. Um, and, and Andrew knew that Jesus was the Messiah there were certain things that he struggled with about, you know, why the Messiah had come. Um, that was a pretty common theme for the disciples. They had, you know, thought that Jesus was going to be an earthly ruler and, you know, restore Israel to the, being the political powerhouse that it once was during the days of King David and King Solomon. But, um, you know, despite that, Andrew knew that God had finally fulfilled his promise to send the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so he was compelled by God's goodness to share that good news that the Messiah had come. Um, and, and that's what motivates us, right? It, it's the, the, the goodness of God, the fact that he fulfills all his promises. That's why we want to uh, tell others about Christ and point uh, others to Christ because um, he is the savior and uh, through faith in the gospel, we enjoy eternal life. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Um, this is a pretty familiar section of scripture. I had uh, alluded to Jesus' great commission 
at the beginning of this Bible study, and uh, these verses are exactly that, Jesus' Great Commission. Uh, Carolyn, could you read that, please? Okay. Jesus, the Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, Authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as... Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. Thank you. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, what did he tell his disciples that he holds? That he would return. Um, maybe, I mean, he, he did give them that promise. That's true. Um, he did promise that he was going to come back, but he, he told that he told them that I have control over something. I hold something in the palm of my hand. What was it? What did Jesus say that he controls? All authority in heaven. Right. All authority, not just in heaven, but also on Earth. On earth, right. So Jesus tells his disciples, I rule everything. Everything is under my control, both in heaven and on earth. So that is that's a, a, a great statement of confidence um, and a great comforting uh, statement for us. That Jesus, who loves us more than anything is in control over all things. Um, and, and so because of that, we know that we are safe in his care. And so because he rules all things, because we are safe in his care, he then commands his disciples and really all believers to do what? Uh, go out into the world and teach all nations, baptize them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. And teach them to obey, obey everything. Yes. That they have been taught. Right, exactly. So he says, go and make disciples. Go and, and go and preach the gospel. Tell others about who I am and what I've done so that they may have the same hope that you have. Right? And then he tells them how he's going to, how they are to do it. I by baptizing, baptizing, by baptizing in the, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay. and by teaching them not just some, not just most, but teach them everything I have commanded you, right? Jesus says, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. So teach them everything I have commanded you. And then what does he assure them of as he, as he goes on his way to heaven and as they go on their way to to make disciples of all I am nations. always with you mm -hmm. to the end of the very to the very end of the age. Yes. What a what a beautiful way that Matthew ends his gospel with that great gospel promise of Jesus and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Just a, a great uh comforting gospel promise in general as we think of life in this world and you know as we go through the the highs of life but then as we you know experience the lows of life and we feel like we're stuck in the valley of the shadow of death and depression and despair and yet Jesus says I am with you always right that's a great comfort just in general but then when you think about mission work and going and making disciples of all nations and you realize the difficulty of that task because you're not always going to have success. Um, and, and not only uh, will you not always have success, but you will also be opposed by some. You know, some people uh, and, you know, countries all around the world censor and shut down Christian churches and even big tech today uh, silences the Christian faith. You know, it, the, so even things like that happen in our very own country today. Um, and yet Jesus says, I'm with you always. Right. In the beginning, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. I rule all things. I control all things. And I will always be with you. And so with that confidence, now we go and we make disciples of all nations by baptizing and by teaching. Great comfort from Jesus. 
Uh, we turn over to the uh, the back side. Um, we find something that uh, that was written by Martin Luther. Um, I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. That's Do you know what that's from? That's from the Apostles' Creed, but I don't know which. There's three three separations, <laughs> and I don't know which one. Right. Yeah, no, you're right. This is from the Catechism. Uh, uh, Luther's explanation to which one of the three articles, the uh, oh, first says, article, the second article, or the third article? I would say the second article. I, I may be wrong. It's <laughs> not the second article. Third? It's the third, right. So the third article is, I believe in the Holy Spirit, third, the Holy, the Holy Christian, Christian Church. Church. Right, mm -hmm, exactly. And the, the work of the Holy Spirit it is all about bringing people to faith through word and sacrament. Mm -hmm. And here Luther correctly explains, I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. It's the Holy Spirit who does this. The Holy Spirit calls me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So um, people cannot choose to come to Christ on their own. That is something that God does through the gospel. And keep in mind, Christ's great commission. How are people going to hear the gospel? It's through us, right? Jesus has tasked us to preach the gospel, to go and make disciples of all nations. And as we do that work, then the Holy Spirit will work through that proclaimed gospel and bring in more disciples for salvation. Wasn't this wasn't part of the third article in the liturgy Sunday? Um, <laughs> we actually used the Nicene Creed this last there Sunday. Another, I thought there was another part where some of it was mentioned. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, last this last Sunday we used the Nicene Creed, but we'll use the Apostles' Creed. No, but uh, this, this was. A uh, 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 section of the Apostles' Creed on the, what does this mean, was somewhere in the litter. We probably, I think we used it uh, on Pentecost Sunday when we were, you know, focusing and celebrating the work of the Holy you Spirit. Know, some of this, you know, it's been years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure we used this part of the like explanation seven, on Pentecost. Like 70 some, it kind of rattles my brain once in a while, and I have to go and look it up in my catechism book. Yeah. Uh, I have another quote from Luther um, as he uh, kind of describes mission work. He says, We are just one mere beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You know, and, and that's kind of what mission work really is. You know, uh, Christ is, you know, the, the living bread from heaven. He strengthens us through the gospel, gives us life through his teachings. Um, and uh, yeah, mission work is, you know, we're, we're beggars. I mean, when you really think about it, uh, we, we are we are completely dependent on Christ for salvation. We we cannot do this on our own in any stretch of the imagination we are completely dependent on christ for salvation and so in a way we're kind of a beggar and as luther says um you know when it comes to mission work we're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread right where to find salvation and it's only found in christ alone that's really breaking it down to the simplest terms mm -hmm. it, it really does definitely um so let's let's continue talking about uh, mission work um of course the the origin of our synod so i mean uh well let's take it back a step further um you know talking about the importance of mission work and how it has played a role in the church and how it affects us um we are we are the beneficiaries of mission work um, you think about where the Apostle Paul went um, during his missionary journeys, right? He went to different places in Asia Minor and then spilled over into Europe. And of course, we know that he was imprisoned in Rome. Um, and the main hub of Christianity for a long time was in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was definitely 
uh, the Apostle Paul or God using the Apostle Paul to make that happen. So uh, uh, Europe is the main hub of Christianity in the world. Um, of course, Martin Luther lived in Germany. So, of course, that's in Europe as well. Um, our Many of our ancestors came over from Europe to America. Um, and, and so, you know, you can kind of connect the dots there. And, and we certainly are affected by mission work. If the apostles, uh, and especially Paul, if they did not go around the world and preach the gospel, we may not be here today in this church. Mm -hmm. You know, so we you can definitely connect the dots and see how we are affected by mission work. Um, the origin of our synod, you know, uh, immigrants coming over from Germany um, and establishing Lutheran churches and our, our our synod founded in the year. By the way, do you know what year our, our synod was founded? No. 1850. Uh, our, our Wells Synod was founded in the year 1850, uh, you know, started from immigrants in Germany who came to America. Um, taking the next step, uh, our congregation, do you know what year our congregation was founded? Well, um, next year in 2024, we're celebrating 150 years. So you do the math and our congregation was founded in 1874. Probably started up by a bunch of German immigrants, like many other Lutheran churches in the Midwest were. You know, I have a history book of the church that I was confirmed in. I'll have to dig it out. It has a whole bunch of the history about the Synod. And, okay, cool. And I'm sure you'd enjoy reading I it. I probably would. I probably would. Um, so... Um, we did a lot of, as the synod uh, began to grow, um, there was a lot of home mission work. So uh, planting of different churches throughout the United States, spilling over into Canada. Um, early mission work was uh, done among the Native American tribes starting around 1893, especially among the Apache in Arizona. And we still are doing mission work with the Apaches in Arizona. Uh, one of my good buddies uh, was a pastor on the uh, uh, was a pastor for the Apaches in Arizona. In the early 1900s, you see a big push for world mission work being done in our synod. Uh, some of the earliest mission work done in Africa uh, was commissioned at, in the 1945 synod convention. And uh, we still do a lot of mission work in Africa. Uh, Japan was the next uh with a missionary in place in around uh in eight or excuse me not eight, uh 1957 and then you take a look uh where we're at today and mm -hmm. uh uh we have uh, wells uh missions all around the world um and uh, we still we still do mission work with the uh, in the apache and reservation uh in arizona uh, we do mission work in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, uh, Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Haiti, right? And that's just, um, you know, Mexico and Central and South America. We, um, we, we do mission work in Nigeria. Uh, uh, Liberia, Cameroon, yeah. Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, M Malawi, Kenya, uh, just and, and many other places in Africa, um, in Europe, uh, in the Wells Connection. Uh, a couple months ago, we w t learned about uh, mission work happening in the UK and in London. So that's pretty cool. Um, in Asia, there are many different places where we're doing mission work in, in uh, South Korea, Russia, Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Vietnam, Thailand, Nepal, India, and even, even in Australia as well. So um, we are doing mission work all around the world because hearing the true gospel of Jesus Christ is so important. Um, it is the most important thing in the world. There's no question about that. And um, this is just fulfilling what Christ asked us to do, to go and make disciples of all nations. 
But we're not just focusing on world missions, but uh, most recently our synod is putting a big emphasis on home missions. Um, perhaps you have heard the ambitious goal that our synod is embarking on, uh, 100 home missions in 10 years in our country. Um, and that, is, that has begun. And it is an ambitious goal but uh, one that will pay eternal dividends. Mm -hmm. So looking forward to seeing uh, the, the fruit that comes from that mission work. But based on what you see in world missions and in home missions, uh, the ambitious goals that they're reaching for, um, you see how important mission work really is. Um, how, can they, how can they call upon the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear of the one who, unless someone goes there and, and, and preaches to them, right? Someone has to go there because as we talked about, people aren't going to just wake up one day and say, I need to, I need to find Christ. Where can I find him? That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, people only become aware of their dependence for Jesus Christ if they're told about it. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, when he was this missionary missionary work in Japan, when Marcy was at prep, there were some uh, students there whose father was a pastor, a missionary in Japan. Okay, hmm, uh -huh. that's interesting. Cool. Uh huh. And uh, uh, when Leonard and I combined houses, we went to. He had things that he just didn't want to sell on the street or something like that. Uh, and we went to the synod office, and he don't. We donated a lot of furniture. At that time, they were making a mission home where the missionaries on coming back would have a place to stay. Okay. Oh, that's very nice, and, and that's actually a great segue into uh, the the final point that I was going to mention in this Bible study. And we already kind of mentioned it, but I think it's worth re mentioning. Um, you know, we may not be able to go to these world missionaries and actually do the mission work. Um, we may not be called to be a part of a new mission start here in the United States, but that doesn't mean that we can't contribute to mission work. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do many things behind the scenes, so to say, um, Prayer, of course, has got to be number one. Praying for missionaries and for those who are uh, receiving the gospel through the missionaries. Prayer is absolutely probably the number one thing. Number two, uh, supporting uh, mission work with offerings so that that work can continue. Um, and it doesn't just have to be, you know, Oh, I'm going to write a check to the Central Africa Medical Mission. It could be that, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, because offerings don't just come in the form of money, but they also come in the form of the way we use our time and the way we use our talents. Um, so, you know, maybe it is donating furniture to a missionary so that they're comfortable in their home. Maybe it is, um, you know, um, volunteering to to help a church and you know and go canvassing and help getting the word out about a new church right our, our synod uh that will help people uh do uh local mi uh, missionary trips um where they'll they'll help you know upstart congregations do different forms of evangelism i've been a part of those uh, as a teenager and as a college student, uh, you know, we we flew to these churches and helped them do outreach. You know, um, that's something we could do as well. Um, writing a letter of encouragement to a missionary, um, that goes a long way too. So there are many, many things that we can do behind the scenes to help mission work. And we should do that um, because it all falls under the umbrella of the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. And if there is anything that we can do to help the gospel be proclaimed in the four corners of the world, then may God move us to help with that cause in any way that we can. Mm -hmm. All right, we will uh, we'll conclude then today. 
Um, just a reminder that we will not meet for class next week uh, because uh, my wife and I will be in the hospital welcoming our newest addition to the family next week. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and there won't be any Monday night Bible study the following week either. Um, Labor Day weekend. Well, th that, well, let's see. Yeah, that would be no. No, no, um, it would be the twenty eighth. That's the following, but uh, there, there's still there there still won't be Bible study on the twenty eighth. So and uh, there the, won't be any on the fourth of September, either. right? Because that that's Labor Day. So for the next three Mondays, which will be the twenty first, the twenty eighth, and September fourth, there will not be Monday night Bible study, but we will resume uh, September eleventh, and uh, we'll continue our uh, study of I am a Lutheran. And uh, let's see, what is our next topic going to be about? Just to kind of uh, what uh, you know, give you a bit of a appetite for what to, the, what we're going to talk about. Um, let's see here. Our next lesson is entitled "I Am a Lutheran and I like I like things better the old way." Well, that should be an interesting discussion. <laughs> You know? I, I let, let yeah. So we'll we'll talk about that uh, September 11th. Um, so with that being said, we'll conclude with the Lord's blessing, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.